There is a banana cake with cream cheese frosting, toasted coconut, and walnuts that go on top and all around the sides. Not to make any of you hungry out there or anything, but my great-grandmother used to make this cake. And on a battered old index card that has been splashed with vanilla and God knows what, you can still see her handwriting, a loopy, scrawly script. And this, this card lived for years in a locked box on the top shelf of my granny's kitchen cupboard in southern Virginia. And this is a cake that had won awards. It had won um, awards at the town fair, and it was not known by anyone other than my great-grandmother how to exactly make this cake. It was a best-kept secret. We all have them, things that we don't want to share. Maybe because we're worried that that favorite restaurant will become too crowded or that music venue just won't have the right feel anymore or that recipe will lose some of its allure. And in our scripture for today that Sylvia is about to read, we hear Jesus asking the disciples to have this deeply spiritual and profound moment where their faith and God's love is made manifest. But according to Jesus, it too should be a best-kept secret. Our scripture reading today is from Luke 9, verses 28 to 36. Now about eight days after these sayings, Jesus took with him Peter and John and James and went up on the mountain to pray. And while he was praying, the appearance of his face changed and his clothes became dazzling white. Suddenly they saw two men, Moses and Elijah, talking to him. They appeared in glory and were speaking of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Now Peter and his companions were weighed down with sleep, but since they had stayed awake, they saw his glory and the two men who stood with him. Just as they were leaving, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah, not knowing what he said. While he was saying this, a cloud came and overshadowed them. And they were terrified as they entered the cloud. Then from the cloud came a voice that said, This is my son, my chosen. Listen to him. When the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone. And they kept silent. And in those days told no one any of the things they had seen. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Amen. Would you please pray with me? Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be glorified in your sight. For you, O oh God, are our rock, and you, O oh God, are our redeemer. Amen. So there are stories that we love to tell, and there are stories that we keep secret. So often we think of those secret stories as hard stories or uncomfortable stories, maybe embarrassing stories. Those forbidden stories that we stuff away like skeletons in a closet. For those of you who have young children or maybe are delightfully young at heart, I can imagine that we don't talk about Bruno, which actually made the top hit list in the past couple of weeks from Disney's movie Encanto, has been playing in your head, a song about a family system that has kept secret the painful parts of the past, especially their lost son, brother, uncle, Bruno. But our story from today is not that kind of story. It is a joyful story. It is a love-filled story. In another translation, in, the, in, in other gospels, the word chosen uh, has also been used interchangeably with the word beloved. This is my beloved, my chosen one. It is a story in which Jesus is affirmed, both by those who came before him, by Moses and Elijah, and by God. 
And why is it that sometimes it is these joyful, these special stories that we forget to tell or that go untold? Why is it that sometimes we keep the best things, well, secret, whether intentionally or not? So I want to tell you a story that I don't think I've shared with you all before. Maybe I've shared with some of you individually or personally, but I don't think I've shared with you all communally. It's a love story. And I'm going to take a stab in the dark because who doesn't love a good love story? Sorry, Seth, there's no... <laughs> no horror here. Or hopefully not. We'll see. It's still being written. Ah, it's about my husband Dan and I. <laughs> so, as many of you know, my husband Dan and I met our first year of Divinity School, and the specifics of this story vary on if you ask my husband Dan or if you ask myself about how we met. But regardless of those specifics, uh, we met at our first year at school at a barbecue where a beer somehow spilled on me and a com conversation started and a friendship blossomed. And that's where our story for today starts, with two friends, two lovers of adventure. Before heading back to campus after that first winter break, we headed north to the White Mountains of New Hampshire to go hiking. And while we love our Midwest lives, I've shared with you, I do lament and miss the mountains a little bit. We were staying with a pastor friend and using his parsonage as a base camp, Pastor Gilman Healy's home for wayward seminarians. And while it wasn't polar vortex cold like it gets here in the Midwest, it was really cold in the single digits with high winds on our way into the town the night before, we were really worried that we would have to pull over my husband's 01 Honda Civic because the snow was coming so fast and so densely that we had trouble seeing out the windshield. But with the excitement of the naive, or maybe the foolish bordering on the dangerous, we headed out that next morning with one borrowed pair of those little micro spikes that maybe you've seen and one borrowed pair of trekking poles. We left before dawn, getting to the trail a little bit after first light. We were still in that stage in a relationship where impressing one another seemed important. I don't know if anyone else ever had that stage in their relationship, but it was part of ours. Our intention that day was to make a big loop we would take one trail up the mountain, rock, walk along the ridge line, and take another trail down. We'd even brought our sleeping bags that were in the trunk of the car and a tent and a backpacking stove so we could camp out in the snow. Naive, infatuated, foolish, tomato, tomato. <laughs> Thankfully, that morning, we were not the earliest birds, and some snowshoers had at least somewhat packed down the trail ahead of us. So literally, we walked in their steps as we hiked, talking and sharing of our lives, uh, telling stories about our childhood, and asking those silly what-if questions that you ask when you're first getting to know someone. What if you had been born in a different era? When would you have wanted to be born? Or what would you want to do if you didn't want to be a pastor? Slow and steady, and up and up we climbed until we came across two hikers who were descending the mountain. Honestly, the most grizzled men that I'd ever seen. One of them had one of those big, bushy beards that had icicles hanging from it. They had those giant, like, ice crampons that you put on the bottom of your shoes and pickaxe it, like ice picks in the back of their backpacks. And they looked us over. They looked up and down. And with doubt in their voices, they asked, are you heading to the top? We replied we were, and we shared our plans, and their looks of disbelief grew. Listen, one man said. My buddy's face started to freeze halfway across the ridge. Be careful. It's some of the strongest winds we've seen. For those of you who don't know the White Mountains, every couple of years people actually die up there of hypothermia or avalanche, it isn't just a walk in the park. We could tell that they thought we should head back, but our excitement kept us going. 
We thanked the men, assured them that we would turn around if needed, and carried on our way. And as the trees grew smaller, turning into bushes and then just bare rock in what's called the alpine zone, where conditions are so harsh that plants actually can't grow, we understood with full force what these men meant. Behind my $5 Target sunglasses, I could feel my contact lenses freezing in my eyes. It was cold beyond belief, the wind cutting through to our sweaty skin. But we took a moment, and we turned around, and we looked back, like Lot's wife from where we came. And the clear blue sky and the shining white of those mountains was more beautiful than anything I had ever seen. And I will say we did abandon our plans and start to head back down. <laughs> it's funny how sometimes the most beautiful of things are in the harshest of environments. We couldn't stay there. We had to continue on our journey. But what we saw was truly beloved by God, hewn of God's hand, and holy. I cannot help but be reminded of that day on this Transfiguration Sunday, another kind of love story, a story that also maybe goes untold amidst those favorite gospel lessons of the feeding of the 5,000 or water being turned into wine or holy dinner table moments. Maybe this story is one of the kept best secrets in the Bible, for it's a story of God's love and the ways that it transfigures, it transforms us. Where Jesus, it is a story where Jesus just takes a few, a few of his disciples, Peter, the rock upon which the church would be built, his brother James, and John, the beloved disciple, and they get away from the crowds, and he leads them up to a mountain where he is transfigured, dazzling snow-white robes. And Jesus is joined by two of the great patriarchs of the Jewish faith, Moses and Elijah. And Peter, the builder of the church, comments on how good it is to be there and asks to build three dwellings so that they can stay. But they cannot stay on the mountain. Mountaintops are foolish places to build homes. A cloud swallows the disciples, and they're scared, terrified. And God's voice echoes words that were spoken at the very start of Jesus' ministry. In the waters of the Jordan, when the skies opened and a dove descended, this is my chosen, this is my beloved. Jesus' belovedness and connection to the wise ones who came before is witnessed and affirmed. And I can only imagine what it would have felt like for Peter and James and John, what wonder and awe, what hope filled their spirits. And while there's this desire to stay there, to build homes in these beautiful, awe-inspiring moments, we are not meant to. Sometimes, like that mountaintop, the physical space will not allow us to stay there. In other instances, it is time itself that moves us onward. These experiences are fleeting, and yet they are essential. Dan and I had to come off that mountain. Honestly, we would have frozen if we'd stayed any longer, future grizzled hikers finding our bodies in the spring. So we decided to come off the mountain as quickly as possible, hoping to increase our body temperature as we move, dreaming of our car's wonderful heater. Shaking slightly in our chill, I remember getting into the car, the ways that my muscles ached after a long day, and we cranked up that sweet, hot, dry air as we wound our way through the mountain roads, listening to fleet foxes on the radio, the sun setting pinks and purples, setting the sky and those white mountains around them on fire. And it was in that moment that I thought for the first time, I love this man. 
And the journey that started over 10 years ago has led us up countless mountains, and it's led us into some dark valleys too. And we have seen God's beloved in the world and felt surrounded by God's holy love. But we had to come off the mountain. We had to begin. And it is in the telling of this story, when Dan and I tell this story, it's how we remind ourselves of how we started, how love formed of who we were and who we are. It's a reminder that these stories aren't meant to be kept secret. Jesus, too, could not stay on the mountain. The journey that he was being called to was just in its infancy. So much lay ahead of him. But going to that mountain was an essential part of the journey. Gathering those who were closest, being affirmed, was an essential part. But the mountain is not a place to set up camp. No, Jesus knew that his place was among the people, teaching and preaching and healing. And those things weren't possible in that place. I can't help but wonder for all of you what your mountaintop moments have been. Where have you seen wonder and awe and beauty? Where have you been transformed by God's love? So often we're like Peter, we want to set up home in that place and bask in those moments and hold too tight for too long to things that we need to be changed by and to move forward from. Because there is a lot of journey ahead for each of us in these lives of faith. We just have to be courageous enough to walk into the unknown. And I promise you it will be beautiful. There will be fiery sunsets ahead and affirmations of love. And there too, though, will be heartache. But God walks with us and whispers that we too are chosen. We too are beloved. That's a story I want to tell and a journey I want to travel. And while Jesus encourages the disciples to say nothing, I wonder if our call now is actually quite different. I wonder if we're being called, invited, challenged to tell our stories, our best kept secrets, to have them remind us of where we come from and whose we are, in the midst of the brokenness that threatens to break us, of the political posturing of pandemics, of the heartache of war, I wonder if we're also being encouraged to have the courage to tell of our mountaintops and to use these stories to empower us to the work that God calls each of us to. Because I believe in that work. The work of God's love in the world is the most powerful force. It is what will transfigure. It is what will transform us and the world. Amen. <laughs>